I'm pleased to introduce our friend and colleague, Dora Epstein-Jones, today. Uh, I understand Dora's framing today's talk with a discussion posing a series of questions that she'll discuss with Todd. This is fitting because Dora's influence at SciArc for me has been one of focusing the discursive aspects of theory and history as we progress through the important work being done in the curriculum. Dora is a valued member of the undergraduate thesis team as a critical rover. Her influence in sharpening students' arguments, challenging positions, and always reminding us of the theoretical context in which our arguments are situated is evident in the thesis work every year. Dora's writings tackle notions of gender, sex, mobility, and criticality, yet her interests are not only in the purely theoretical realm. As she is just as comfortable addressing the more prosaic aspects of tectonics and practice. To me, this is an important, agile aspect of her abilities as a critic in the design studios. I was given a, a Dora's bio, um, and there's an image which she includes. It's a rendering of a desk, and I wish I had time to put it on, but I didn't. Um, and I'll have to describe it to you. It's uh, a mechanism, a hybrid computer monitor and tabletop integrated into a desk, supported by two stacks of books on either side. The books are compressed with clamps that are seemingly squeezing in the stacks vertically. One could read this image in a number of ways, but for me it represents an interesting position that comments on the importance of building on a historical and theoretical basis, yet admitting in a humorous manner the perhaps paradoxical dilemma of current digital technologies in our culture. That is to say, Dora is willing to fully engage in the digital mechanism, but one way or another, the writings, essays, treatises, and discourse will play an important and supportive role, even if they have to be squeezed and compressed into submission. Please welcome Dora Epstein-Jones. Can you all hear me? All right, okay. Thank you, John. Um, and thank you in advance, Todd, uh, for being really nice. And um, thank you. And, <laughs> and, and, and thank you, Cyark. Um, I'm in the position of being what I call the opposite lecturer, which is that usually you know the work of someone from afar, and then you invite the lecturer in and you meet them, and uh, so I'm the opposite. You, you all know me, but you don't necessarily know my work. And I think it would help if I made my work, or at least my words, more visually exciting. Um, so if you have suggestions for how I might go about doing that, but I'm really glad to see that using the word stacked drew some of you. Um, so uh, that's, all, that's all good. Um, I also want to say today that, as, as John said, I, I'm not, I'm not going to lecture. I'm here more for a discussion on what I see as an emerging design phenomena, the, the, the impulse toward stacking. And so invite your thoughts and look forward to your insights and comments and questions and the collective intelligence that I've come to rely on that is SciArc. Um, so a little bit of background before we get into it. My work in architecture actually began just slightly outside of architecture, mainly trying to convince a dissertation committee that this was architecture enough to write a dissertation on. And uh, despite the whole Frenchness of it, it, it just wasn't. Um, architecture enough. And so I started to do what, you know, any, I think, good student would do and began to seek out more architectural examples, namely places where architects had experimented with the forms, surfaces, geometries, and or lightness of mobility to varying degrees, and had either embraced it or rejected it, or tried it out for a while and rejected it. <laughs> And I suppose this was how I became so invested in the promise and what I called the agility of the architectural discipline as a whole. And this image is one of those, if you're in my class, you know it, it's my go-to image because I see it as a sort of opposition, um, a desire for a new age by Le Corbusier. Not, not this one, the classical, but this one, the modern as embodied in the automobile. And it was in that work, that unfolding of architectural examples, that I came across this 
so it's the Wolfson House by Marcel Breuer, um, built for Sidney Wolfson. It started out as a 1947 Spartan trailer, and he asked Marcel Breuer to build a house onto his trailer. And uh, there it is in plan, that capsule there is the trailer part, and the rest is, of course, Marcel Breuer, kind of a wood-clad box, actually kind of a monocoque in its way. From looking at the Wolfson house, I began to spin what for me became the tale, which I suppose is the difference between the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the project and say, in this case, uh, uh, the paper, as Eisenman you know, is discussing, it's sort of the forest and, and the trees, that it wasn't necessarily about this one house, but the issues that allowed this house to become a touchstone for me. So first off, I had to fight the elephant in the room, which is the contrast between the little A and the big A architecture, and really choose to not wage the war um, based on the cultural or political discussion between those little A, big A architectures. But I wanted to understand it on its own disciplinary terms. And so for me, this larger set of issues and really what propels a lot of my work is the relationship between um, the traditional difference and the heavily maintained difference, the, the maintenance of that difference between what I call the geometric, as in the smooth portion, the, the trailer, the car, and the tectonic, or the part to whole. And so in something like the Wolfson House, these don't connect easily conceptually or materially or even as construction, it's a hard connection. And so this house became fairly symptomatic for me of this schism that I've come to know and understand between the geometric and the tectonic in architecture. When I not much later turned my attention to prefabrication, this was essentially the same dilemma in the packaged house. I wanted to know why prefabrication fails, as in why it gets resurrected every 10 or 20 years in architecture and then seems to die its own sort of quiet death all over again. And I began to attribute this failure to the refinement of an idea into a simple system that the very tectonic that's supposed to deliver variability and flexibility is and was its limiting factor, that only so much could be done with it. And so this is the, the wedge connector by Voxman um, that uh, uh, John has certainly redrawn beautifully, um, and uh, how that wedge connector would work. It works in basically uh, six different directions. And then um, the panels uh, for the uh, general panel house. Um, because basically it's only a panel, the module is only a panel and then it has the uh, connector. And because it only connects at, at, at right angles, I, I see this, I saw this as actually like, it's good for a while and then the architect starts to become desperate. And I, this dropping of the post here is like a cry for help. It's like, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, that's somebody getting desperate because they're disrupting the um, system's own uh, logics. And so therefore, obviously a problem of geometry in the sense of a kind of problem of, of super limited geometry and um, also a problem of uh, module size in terms of the panel, but also module sameness, the repetition of the panel at the exact same size, scale, and uh, dimension. And so if that's a little cry for help, this is a scream, this is, this is Gropius farming the system out to other architects to see it, how they would do it um, and uh, hoping to get sort of other architecture uh, based on um, other, other people's genius to introduce more variation into the system or to hope to introduce more variation into the system. 
And I began to describe this, this, this dilemma that was presented by the packaged house as the same old, same old, as in the endless repetition with very little chance for differentiation, and these are the panels about to be shipped for, for general panel. So this is also where my work started to converge with Wes's work and um, had to do with, with uh, looking at the dimension, say, of the module, although the panel is a kind of funky module. Um, and uh, the container is great because it scales up that, that module a lot, and so all of the problems tend to get kind of super obvious when you start to work with a brick that large. And um, especially when the desire is, as, the, as Wes articulated this desire very well, that you want to use the container. The, the whole point of wanting to use the container is to use it as structure, to not have to use a structure in addition to, to the container. So um, for Wes, this went into the direction of what uh, he, he uh, really smartly called lumpy logic, which was this idea that the container could serve as uh, the structural member, and of course in this case the stack of the containers could be the, the, the structure, but that the space in between the um, uh, containers could be opened up. So, that, so you, you can't cut into these containers too much if you want to use them structurally. So that's kind of the rules. You can't cut into it too much, and two, you've got to open up some space to get over the eight-foot width problem that would otherwise pervade the containers and so um, and the container arrangement and configurations. And so Wes started to call this lumpy logic because he was thinking of it as the containers were kind of like lumps in oatmeal. And, um, and I suppose, I, although now that I think about the analogy, I'm wondering if the lumps in oatmeal uh, help hold the oatmeal up. I don't think that's the case, but that, all right. Um, uh, that's his, that's his, <laughs> that, that's his argument. Um, my uh, uh, argument um, ended up going more in the direction of the idea that the module is a limit condition for design. That like in the packaged house, contrary to the idea of the module as flexible and therefore freeing, the module provided a limited set of options and effects. And so the larger the module and the more that you rely on it as a structural member, the limited set of configurations, the L, the H, the T, um, and uh, uh, were glaringly symptomatic. And they were even more glaringly symptomatic the more you stack them. So what you get from you know, stacking one or two containers um, on top of each other, a lot more uh, effect than the, the kind of endless repetition that starts to happen once you start to stack them uh, a lot higher. So, the next set of work that, that I embarked on was um, a, editing a book here and then also working with Office DAW on their monograph. Um, and, um, and their work really uh, it excited me because on one hand it was incredibly disciplinary. It was, it was definitely, you know, here is this classical mode of masonry bricks. They use things like, like, like bricks. And at the same time, trying to step out of the ordained limits of effects, really through a pushing of techniques. And in this case, a sort of differential surface that, uh, that, that the bricks can, um, can afford and these projective textures on the Tongshan Gatehouse. But, but bricks are kind of small as, um, as modules go. They certainly probably aren't even modules. Um, and um, so, uh, but, but worthy of considering when you start to imagine them in terms of this stacking issue and variability and, um, and difference. And so, you know, looking at bricks, I began to think, you know, they're pretty powerful, really, in that we, we, think, of, we think of bricks as being a kind of unified and unifying element, but um, in fact, they routinely ask us to consider the offset when, when they stack, and that that offset introduces a measure of, um, a, of a possible, um, for me, um, geometric uh, variability. And so 
Now, this doesn't mean that, that, that the bricks are free. They're actually also caught in their own historical trajectories. And, um, and classically, even today, we read them in a seamless and fairly, as a fairly seamless and fairly unified um, uh, mass maker, especially on the flat side, um, say, of a wall construction. Um, in, in other words, the, um, the stacked element, or the stacked elements, especially sim uh, symptomatized in the brick, um, is, uh, is, is usually or historically been understood as moving toward efficiency, moving toward a seamlessness to create solidity, moving toward exact repetition to create regularity, and of course, a kind of single perceived morphology. So you get the wall or the layered volume like floor plates or the column or the support, and frankly, that's not the case. That's not what I'm observing now. So this brings me to my provocation. My provocation is kind of in three parts, stacked, stacked. So stacking asks us to reconsider the differences between, or the perceived differences, or the perceived tensions between the geometric and the tectonic, as well as our prejudices toward either. So one stack is just a stack, as in the parts, the pieces, the modules, however you want to talk about it, laid atop each other to achieve verticality. And the stack is just a stack. The geometry of the member shouldn't matter as long as it attains cohesion with the geometry of the members directly above or below it. And this seems very straightforward, as in these kind of neoclassical columns where you get the idea of that disk. It has a um, exact and perfect relationship with the disk directly ab above or below it. But it's also basic and disciplinary that there exists in the column two different morphological trajectories. The column as standing and its geometry, it's tectonic, and the versus the geometry of the lozenge once you turn it on its side, and I think Eisenman referred to this in his talk as well, so that even though bricks and, and columns and uh, other forms of disciplinary stacking appear as if seamless, there's actually a very strong tension between the geometric and the tectonic that's rooted in the discipline, and it is a problem that appears in the stack. So stacking too. So lately we're seeing a lot more experimentation, um, and uh, I couldn't not do this. Uh, so um, uh, and so stacked in one way as a kind of you know a, a relationship of parts. In, the, in this way, as a desirable arrangement of what I would call precariously balanced parts. And, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the really big boobs, right? You know, the really high heels and, you know, and all of this kind of uh, tipping. And um, there's a lot of, you know, images that proliferate with this um, in uh, popular culture and art from, from, from this, you know, sort of image of this um, uh, boat to uh, thank you, Marcello, this uh, um, Alan Delorme's um, totem photographs, and he has like tons of these, of these just, you know, people on bicycles with way too much stuff stacked on. And um, that these are suggestive of a very dangerous tipping point, a kind of more random act of architecture, a bunch of stuff in a fairly agglomerized fashion that isn't necessarily stable. And there are a number, another one that showed up in a um, art exhibition recently. And there are a number of contemporary examples of this now actually, I think, emerging as a species or at least a subspecies, typically at the level of the floor plate, energetically embracing the desire for stacked things to offset as a way of destabilizing the tectonic whole or the morphological whole even. 
And it's, it's, it's somewhat reminiscent to me of the initial excitement or even the current excitement for the cantilever, like getting excited about a cantilever, um, uh, that the tectonic give in this case is the appearance of something essentially off-center or ever so slightly about to spin off balance and that these things are, are in this kind of tension with each other and this produces this tremendous visual excitement especially when it becomes top heavy or when the offset becomes less predictable as the plates stack. And yet that's a cake mold that you can buy and you can make that cake or you can make the Samatar Tower um, with it and um, it'd be a really yummy cake. Um, so, uh, um, so, so there's, there, there's that kind of stack of the, of the dangerous tipping point and maybe it's a little bit postmodern but this kind of dangerous tipping point, this sort of invitation of catastrophe and then there's this kind of stacked, which is stacked like cards. And, and when a deck is stacked, uh, it's the game can still proceed, but typically there is an outcome that's assured either by the, 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 the dealer who's stacked um, for or against. And um, as well, the uh, cards, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the cards can also, you can use them to play tricks. So there's an aspect of cheating, assured outcomes, and the possibility of tricks. And I think this is kind of where the, the, the contemporary design phenomena of stacking becomes really very, very interesting for me in this investigation between the ge geometric and the tectonic. So there seems to be something in the air, something emerging that's pushing on this maintained difference between the geometric and the tectonic, signaling that we're in a transitional state. And whether this is people who work with shingles or people who are doing these kind of nouveau columns or, or stacking, I, I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, contemporary examples um, of that. And toward that end, um, there is what I'll call a meta read, which suggests that the geometric as a wild, uncontrollable flip side to the surety of tectonics, that the stability that underlies tectonic logics can be upset by the ir irregularity and irrationality of new geometries. And there's a conscious exploitation of the offset, especially the offset of something like the, the string course, to introduce these differentials and thus create irregular stack conditions, such as a wall, um, uh, because they like to swerve. You know, when you stack these things in a different geometric configuration, they will swerve. Or the enclosure for, for, the, same, for the same reason. And so I find it, you know, it's highly symptomatic that the robot gets introduced here in this work as if it's kind of another layer of control and precision that's necessary in this very, very delicate operation. But in this case, the robots are actually the progenitors of the out of control geometry. And so in this case, the brick is pretty regular and stays rather small and rectangular and kind of brick brick-like, but, but the effects of what it makes, and this is Gramazio and Kohler as well, are, are uh, um, geometrically uh, very, very complex. I've got low-tech notes here. Um, so uh, in this type of work, this is also a clue, I think, and in, in this case, the uh, volume is at the, the uh, iconic form of the pitched roof which doesn't lend itself to the proposition of stacking easily. It could be therefore understood as a precariously balanced part and belonging to that um, uh, uh, group of uh, stack that I showed before of these precariously balanced parts. But it's also got to perform a whole bunch of geometric gymnastics in order to appear as if off balanced and stacked. And so I find the construction um, uh, photographs may be a little bit more interesting in this regard, um, that, that uh, it, it's, it's, it's playing a game to appear as if off balance, um, and as well the section in, uh, in this stack, as well from Stephen Hall. <laughs> 
Where this gets really kind of interesting, both ugly and interesting for me in the sense of the kind of sticky wicket for me, is, uh, is, is when we start to talk about um, not a, a regular geometric thing being stacked in an irregular way, um, but irregular geometric things being stacked. So this is, this is where uh, it, it can be, my first read of this was very disconcerting. So my first read of this was a bit of dismay because on one hand I saw this as um, possibly reducing the geometry of the blob into a just a tectonic part and, and that bothered me because it, it to me devalued the possibility of that, of, of what that geometry can uh, can do, and but I think I was coming at it from the idea that it was risking that same old, same old. That it was risking a kind of repeat of that same old, same old that I, I saw in 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 the packaged house. And it probably wasn't actually this as much as say this that was bothering me. So the idea that this was a kind of planned stack as opposed to an accidental stack in which to experiment and witness the effects of, of that stacking. But since that time, I've, I've warmed up a bit, and I, and I have to say I've actually warmed up a lot because I'm starting to recognize the idea of stacking as a primary disciplinary activity and that the more unstable the geometry of the members, the more we can learn from the act of stacking. And this has warmed me up to this irregular shape as the stacking, if you will, for lack of a better word, modules. So even though these are a lot less desirous of stacking, like bricks or floor plates, they're somehow more flexible in terms of the dimensions of the shape morphologies. And when stacking works this way, it's asking us to think in terms of not so much things, parts to holes, and kind of getting back to the regular logic of tectonics, but in terms of dimensions. The way in which surfaces touch and transfer loads to each other, not just horizontal, horizontally and vertically, and, but in many other possible tangents, not directly at horizontal or vertical angles or points. And there are unneat stacks that really show this kind of point to point transference. And there are neater stacks that show this kind of point to point transference. And it, it uh, disciplinarily reminds me of this uh, um, uh, hegemony this juncture point in terms of the technology of representation between Alberti and Piero that Robin Evans discusses so well, which uh, has to do in this case with the technologies of uh, perspective, but um, uh, describes a hegemony that, that this, is, this is what won versus the more NURB constructed curve that I think is pre-suggested by Piero in uh, the uh, 15th century. And um, so that while the sense of the tectonic is that it seems utterly architectural, as in stacks and blocks and voila, I'm an architect, it doesn't necessarily imply that we must also obey the rules of orthogonal or platonic geometries when we stack. So contemporary stacking, and this slide didn't really come out that, that well, also asks us to think in terms of shape morphologies, of new ways of, of imagining part to whole relationships perhaps, irregular things making irregular piles and good for it when that pile or that stack fails because it's helping us to redescribe the maintained difference between the tectonic and the geometric instead as merely touch points. And I think that touch points are a much more interesting possibility. More importantly, it's urging us to reconsider tectonics not as a stodgy throwback, and, and you know, I'm reminded here of Greglin in 1997, tectonics is square, topology is groovy, that's then, this is now. Um, so not tectonics as a stodgy throwback, 
but actually as a more complex way of imagining the continuing architecturalization of geometry. And as we continue to architecturalize differing geometries, I think we need tectonics to discover and unlock the capabilities of both. Tectonics can and should be a consistent wrench in a condition of otherwise smoothness, a falling off point that perhaps keeps and stewards and I'll just allow us to hang on to our own prejudices and biases, the architectural part of the equation. So with that, I wanna show two short videos. Um, one that Sanford Quinter is showing in his talk advocating the kind of magic of architecture. And another that um, I don't think is any less uh, magical. So here's where the technology will fail me, undoubtedly. And um, all right. We're good. I think we're good. World champion Hiroyuki Suzuki! Just put your paws out. Because you were born this way, baby. 
you, Todd. I just want to watch the yo-yo guys some more. <laughs> uh, I, when I was in grad school, uh, a, one of the guys in my studio challenged Jeff Kipnis to a yo-yo competition, uh, which Jeff accepted. And they, they actually had it out in a shopping mall in Columbus. <laughs> Funniest thing I've ever seen. Jeff turns out to be a pretty good yo-yo guy. Can he yo-yo? Really well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the competition was a draw. Nobody was willing to vote one way or another. I didn't, I didn't know this. Um, so I told that story because I was kind of stalling, hoping something would pop into my head to say. Uh, it didn't work. Um, that was great. Um, the yeah, I turn out to be smarter than I look. <laughs> I turn out to be the reverse. Um, <laughs> uh, well, we, we you kind of do have an you know, Ivy League thing about you. It's an illusion. Yeah, it's cool. Um, in any event, we had talked earlier about, uh, about the kind of core disciplinarity of some of the, the questions that you were raising. And it led me, of course, to um, some of my own research. And in particular, a quote from Rainer Banham, who on his deathbed uh, wrote his last essay, which is called The Black Box. And in that essay, uh, as many of you maybe know, um, he was trying to kind of basically sum up his life's work in architectural history and theory, and he was also trying to make his final case for what is architecture anyway. And one of the things that he said on the way to it was that, like, this whole business of saying everything is architecture is probably a bad idea. We should throw out all of the Zulu crawls and Kruk houses and Hogan's and lunar excursion modules and all of the other stuff that has been kind of corralled into the discipline and just come to terms with the fact that architecture is from masonry, it's held together by gravity, and its volumes are effectively closed. So that, that was his kind of final definition of architecture. And he went on to say that in fact, architecture wasn't even about the things itself. That, that architecture, in his very famous phrase, was not about what was done, but rather how it was done. And for Bam, the how of architecture that made a problem disciplinarily specific was drawing. And drawing, in particular way, disegno. Right? So drawing as it developed out of the Mediterranean basin from the 15th century onward. So Banham makes this incredibly tight definition, and it comes in contrast to basically the typical understanding of what his work was about, which was basically projecting architecture beyond exactly those disciplinary conventions that he, in the end, decided was what architecture was about anyway. Um, and the reason that I bring this up was that was to kind of raise the question of maybe Bantam needed 20 more years for the kind of push beyond disciplinary to happen. So all of the, uh, all of the f specific topics that he undertook, whether it was the new brutalism or the architecture of the well-tempered environment, to name maybe the two most extreme cases, but certainly Mark Graham and anybody else. Uh, he basically started off seeing these are, guys, these are finally gonna make the revolution, we're gonna finally get out from under architecture. And the conclusion of each one of those studies is basically, damn it, it didn't work. Right. And isn't that a tragedy? And the stacking that you bring up today obviously reminds me of the kind of tectonic, the masonry tectonics that Bannon brings up in his ultimate definition. But also, and in many of the work that, the projects that you showed, the, the issue that there seems to be quite a lot of pressure being put on traditional notions of disciplinarity in architecture today by new technologies, by new uh, design techniques, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, a kind of a incessant return to exactly those problems, right? So that on one hand, we seem to be, kind of, especially at a school like SIAR, kind of aggressively committed to the uh, transgression of disciplinary boundaries, but at the same time, 
equally committed to the interrogation of what it means to transgress those boundaries. And I would say to that, you know, yeah, that, you that write the actually conclusion. that to me is what architecture <clears throat> is mm -hmm. and what keeps it from being building um, is that that's what it has to do. My argument all along has been that the architectural discipline, unlike the figuring of the architectural discipline as a kind of weak thing to be overthrown or defeated, um, as it was by the postmodernists, I see the architectural discipline as very strong. And um, its strength lies in its agility. Its strength lies in its ability to conceptualize outside of itself and then bring that back as part of the discipline continuously over time. So whether that was by the French Academy in the Carrel, which I think is a similar, I think we're in you know, a Carrel in, a, you know, in, in, in kind of the same way, um, or the Beaux-Arts, I mean these kind of redefinitions of redefinitions of redefinitions that are supposed to produce revolution, don't not produce revolution. They keep the discipline alive and they keep the discipline what it is. And so, um, I find it kind of exciting that, uh, um, that, that, for example, Bannum, I find Bannum's an interesting character for me because what I would say about Bannum is that Bannum's in an age now where it's not where it would have sufficed that he would, oh, if he were alive today, but rather why do we keep bringing him in and making him relevant? And I think it's because we do have a hard time wrapping our minds around the revolutionary moment that we're in. And so that's why, you know, I'm pointing to these stacks, not just because I think the stacks are, you know, interesting, but I think because they signal that this transitional state, this, mm -hmm. this, this moment before the next jump into the, the next form of, of architecture. So it has to be ultra experimental and ultra disciplinary at the same time. These are dependent on each other. And, and that's what I'm saying. I think we have to rethink tectonics, not along the 19th century lines in which they had been figured. So you know, you bring this what and how here, and I'm reminded of Frampton's what and how formulation in the Crises of Industrialization essay in Oppositions, in which you know, he's like, well, here's, you know, architecture had, had devolved it for him by the 17, eight, late 18th century into a architecture of what and an architecture of how because of the professionalization of engineering. Mm -hmm. But now we're back at this point well, where we're doing our own, you know, fabricating. I mean, we're sort of, you know, avant and going back to the engineers saying, hey, will this stand up? And the engineers are going, hmm, let me, <laughs> let me calculate that and see if it'll work. And, and but, well, but once I see now, that, I then I see that push. But being, the issue now is that generally when we go to the engineers and say, can this stand up? They'll say, yeah, sure. You know, yeah, that, why that, not? That, that, um, <laughs> the, the, some of the tectonic limitations that had plagued the discipline for much of the 500 years that you know, it's been around is, uh, have been overcome in a way. And so suddenly this sort of triple inflection of stacking Right, where it's at once indicative of the tensions inherent to the discipline or of unstable balancing acts or even of cheating, you know, whether it's kind of rebar or well, hidden I, but structural. What I'm saying is I think actually the cheat is the disciplinary. <clears throat> I, I think that that's that disciplinary strength that just keeps, that, that keeps pulling on it. I think that, you know, that the, the, the outcome is, uh, uh, is, you know, it can be magic, it can be, you know, but it, it's also a kind of assured outcome for me. Once you start stacking, it's, it's hard to not be architecture. Really? Well, that's what I'm bringing here. I don't know. I don't know. I, what do you that think? I find, I, well, <laughs> no, I, I, I think, I'm not sure that all stacks would qualify as architecture. I, I tend no, no, toward no, the, right. the, tighter, the tighter definitions of the discipline that, 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 than the kind of Alice's architecture crowd. But, yeah, but no, these aren't, but I'm not saying this, this is not but, but dumb for, stacking. No, but for me, I, I, I think like it is. This is not like a three-year-old yeah. at the airport stacking Legos. But, but the idea of, of being able, like that it, that it becomes kind of legal to cheat in a way, or to stack the deck in that, 
that any number of structural ad hoc solutions to produce weird cantilevers or unstable we things or any of that to. stuff. Don't you think we have to? Start I absolutely that? think we have to, yeah. and I think that that's that's the the kind of the big disciplinary problem that you raised for me is is that the the kind of maybe the the ethical undercurrent in all of this stuff in that if architecture for so long has been rooted to uh, kind of protestations of truth to materials or kind of honesty of right. methodology or any of that, that, that the contemporary, these contemporary experiments seem to be kind of doing away with the, that kind of uh, prudish yeah. adherence to they're honesty. They're earnest in yeah. the same way, but they're not, yeah, they're not, they're not honest. But the same, but strangely enough, as that kind of uh, festival of rule breaking commences, the incredible earnestness with which much of that work is described, I find to be hilarious. And uh, I mean, what do yeah, you think about that? You know, I mean, it does seem that I, the, I, the, I, the I sort of rhetoric that. of these projects doesn't seem to line up with the. It, 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 I don't think it often does justice to the kind of innovation that's happening because it tends to get couched in older ideas like truth to materials and blah, right. blah, blah. Well, I found it kind of interesting when I was putting the slides together for this that everything was called a pavilion. Right? Like it was a this p stack pavilion, a that well, pavilion. Well, because I, I think pavilion, pavilion. pavilion is a way to kind of hedge your bet, to stick with your, to stick with your metaphor, right? That, that, that you get supposedly a pass because it's a sort of slightly reduced version of architecture proper, right? That pavilions tend not to have no real program. Uh, responsibilities in the way that a kind of piece of architecture has. But for me, I mean, I, I, I like them better when they're not pavilions. I mean, I, I think that, that we've, for long enough, we've gotten the sort of, uh, we've taken advantage of the, the, the experimental cage for too long. And I think that like less pavilions and more buildings would be a kind of good way to come away from this. And I think, and because I think to, to kind of put some of the provocations that you put forward into the building industry is where the kind of architecture is really going to take off. I mean, I think it's very easy working in very constri constrained boundaries, not only to advance experimental ideas much more quickly, but also to protect them from outside influences maybe a little bit longer than is useful. And I think we've probably reached that point where it's probably getting less and less and less useful to protect our experiments from the, On the other the hand, world. I'd like to see more experiments not so invested in materiality, right? That the stack starts to imply, you know, you say, oh, there's truth, truth to materials. And, you know, that ghost comes up, I think, because <clears throat> of the reliance on understanding these things materially, that they're fabricated and then stacked or fabricated using robots or whatever the case may be, but fabricated nonetheless. And I'd like to actually see the touch point theory, which is what I would advance instead of the tectonic theory, uh, um, as uh, something that one could potentially discover you know, using software instead of having to like make the thing out of cardboard and then, you know, <laughs> then see it fail or, you know. But I think we see a lot of that. Make I mean, it out of foam or, you, you know, know whatever and, you know, like and then take, see what happens. Take the blob wall, for instance, which collapsed or partially collapsed. That was awesome when it did that. And yeah. well, and the thing was, I remember talking to Greg a little bit about it. And then there was the, the thing kept coming up as like, well, we were looking at a brick problem and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, the, 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 it actually wasn't a brick problem that brought it down. It was a mortar problem was a mortar that brought problem, it down. Right. That, that there had not been sufficient consideration of the asymmetrical loads on the joints blob to blob. And so they ripped apart and that was Which can be the solved failure. with glue. Well, they tried to solve it with welding and it didn't work. But the, the point is, I think that those, the, the, the material question of that, that you, you know, some of those things exceed the study in the computer. And I, so I don't know, I sort of think that you got to make them, and you got to make them out of the actual stuff. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm not down on them being made necessarily, but I'm just saying you know we're getting to the point where you know the 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 material can be more and more you know uh, 
advanced in the sense of composites and gluing and taping and so forth, so that I would think that the materials actually could become not so much about, you know, what, what is, why are tectonics only associated with materials, for example? That, to me, that's a disciplinary speed bump that I think that we have to smooth over or do something with because it's unnecessary now. And uh, as we enter into this, you know, with, with, you know, things being made out of composites and gluing and taping and so forth, I would think that the actual materiality could be something that's less of a liability and more of something that, that uh, you don't necessarily have to test on in the same way. Well, um, before I turn it over, I have one more quick one, which is probably in a way asking you to restate what you just said. But um, all of this Whatever I just said and, was great. I, I'm sure, it, I, I know it was, but I, I want to kind of get you to say that, say it again in a different way, which is all, I can't of, all guarantee the kind of that taping, it will be great. all the taping and composites and material experimentations. I mean, you know, Greg has been writing, the, the recent issue of Log has three or four different articles on right, right. Uh, composites and their assembly. And much of that argumentation seems to go the route of this has made previous tectonic questions of part to whole relationships obsolete in some way, and I would want to know if you agree. Have we, uh, have we exceeded tectonics through No, but we, are, we definitely have to reconsider tectonics, and that's what I mean by you have to reconsider the way that, that uh, uh, cause you know, I mean, I think tectonics as a part to whole is a little bit, you know, has, was, you know, exceeded 40, 50 years ago, right? I mean, I don't, I, I'm not necessarily sold on the idea that tectonics is only part to whole. Mm -hmm. But rather that I understand tectonics as being the absolutely complementary relationship to the geometric and that any geometric exploration is going, that's what I'm saying is that it's going to need to test itself against the tectonic at some point as it pushes into its further architecturalization. I think that that's, that's the necessity. And so it behooves us then to rethink tectonics not as just parts to holes, but tectonics as things like load transference, which is a very different you know, way of, of, of perceiving tectonics and understanding tectonics and allowing for their logics to come through to us. I agree. Oh, good. I'm sure. Awesome. Um, look, anybody out there want to chime in? Eric. Yeah, Dora, thank you very much. Um, it seems like you've set up a fairly closed argument, and I'm wondering about so the Acropolis, looking at the collapsed column, is really looking at entropy. And you've made this argument that architecture and is order, stacking is order, stacking is agile but still order, but entropy somehow as nature is not architecture. So when you show the, the, uh, the ship tilting, listing, and having the cargo stuff fall off of it, I still think it's an argument about architecture, but you are making this discussion contingent on a very fine line that architecture can only go so far before it becomes entropic in nature. And I would look at, there was a thesis last year which looked at the idea of stack and pile as, as the remnant condition of the Acropolis with the collapsed Doric column. And I would say that you might have a few breaches in the, in the discourse that would allow for some um, more generative thinking about what the stack is and not uh, solely reinforcing the notion of order and stacking as a kind of architecture. So that's a kind of... Um, I'm pro, I made it more I'm black pro and white. failure. I don't know yeah. if that didn't, why that didn't come across. Well, when you were I, talking, I, about, like when you were talking about Greg's wall collapsing, that was great. And that was a moment of acknowledging that that act of entropy was perhaps... Um, materially within the architectural order, let's say. Sure. And that it really was meant to be uh, entropic, and that's its best uh, resolution. That's another resolution. So when you go back to talking about architecture and stacking as drawing, I would oppose that with the idea that architecture and stacking as behavior gives you something quite different than the idea of why you were so dissatisfied with the elevation of Greg's wall. Right. It was fixed. It was predetermined yeah. and it was absolute. I'd rather that it fail. Yeah, you'd rather let, it fail. rather let it fail. So right. actually Corb looking at the collapsed column is a whole other way of thinking uh, about the revelation of architecture, which 
he understood as someone connected to the idea of ruin, going back to the, right. to the origins. And which is also very classicist. So, very well. Yeah. And very much rooted in the discipline. Yeah, it was yeah. pre, it was pre the, um, the diamond in the forehead about what the modern project was. He, he hadn't hit that yet. And so, you know, the, the discourse about finding a new architecture or the next architecture, uh, I'm wondering about that part of your, of your discussion with regard to the argument, so. Well, I, you know, I mean, this is, this is just a provocation, you know what I mean? So it's not necessarily something that's deep research for me um, at, at this point. I'm thinking, hmm, maybe it could be. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I agree that, that there's certainly an aspect of, of the entropic that, you know, probably has to be pulled out and elaborated on a bit more because I think even just saying, saying failure is probably not enough. Um, that's why I'm interested in Michael Meredith and why, I mean, I showed him twice here, you know, which kind of is like, you know, big props. Um, because uh, because on, on one hand, you know, he does, you know, these very, you know, uh, logical pre-planned kind of stacks. And another thing is he actually does use the software to make the sand, you know, I showed you, and like I said, I was disappointed that those slides didn't show up, didn't, didn't come out. But he does this sort of, these sort of sand piles of blocks and he tries to look for when, when, when they fail. And, um, and so, yeah, it's a kind of disordering the, the, the order. But regardless, it, it falls into a realm of experimentation of effects, which I think is really what the discussion, you know, is, is, is about here. And that it's something that we tend to think of in terms of differentiation, and I want to kind of bring those, bring those together. You know, I mean, Jack here with his little airplane, I think he's interesting because it's like the, you know, it's the, it's, it's, fairly symptomatic, you know, the monocoque, the airplane, the really, the real beauty of the body of, of, of the airplane is visually, in a sense, more attractive for him than uh, the, the Lego stack, right? You know, it's like, okay, I did the Lego stack, I'm really more, much more interested in the airplane. And, and that those are, t tend to think, be thought of as different. And um, I think that they're just far more co, pardon the pun, co-constructive. Marcelo. I, I thanked you. Did you hear that? So maybe I'm thinking something that you already differentiated, but I totally, I mean, I think it's a great topic and one that I'm, you know, personally interested, at least through the work in my studio. Um, I, I totally agree with the idea that, the, that the, the definition of tectonics on this has much more to do with geometry and, and, and form, I would say, than has to do with material. And that's to me is interesting because I don't see, let's say, I wouldn't see a process of stacking or piling in this case, and I will differentiate those two uh, as, let's say, not having to do with composites because composites have to do with continuity and fibrous material, and stacking has to do with bricks. I think this has really nothing to do with the idea of solidity and bricks, and that's to me one of the challenges. So uh, the second part then would be a differentiation between these two. And this is what I would be like really, really adamant about at bringing, um, even though the sensibility might be similar, projects like Ramazio Color, stacking bricks being part of that old idea of tectonics, where let's say it's done with bricks, it's done with stacking, and it's done with whatever the material allows, whether a robot made it or like human hands made it. And the other thing, which is a pile, which is, has completely different connotations, you know? Uh, AI is saying like, you know, it's in that pile over there, you know? Uh, it's in that mess over there, meaning buildings are never meant to be like that. Buildings are uh, stuck for a reason of ordering systems. And whatever ordering system that you might have on that pile over there has to do with something that can happen over time and through a lot of messy decisions that you maybe have some control of. I think the computer allow us to be able to like, you know, uh, mess stuff up with a certain degree of control towards a moment of failure, but just like, you know, one step before that. So I think there is a huge uh, difference, which I think is somewhat evident in what you're saying. So I'm not, this is not quite a question, but, uh, but I think I, I, I agree with your assertion, so. Yeah, I mean, I think a more rigorous analysis would really make a clear kind of differentiation between piling and stacking, which I, I agree. They're very, they're very different. The, the questions of degrees of order is uh, probably something that would need to be, you know, really parsed out and tried and, and try to understand.
absolutely. Yeah, um, this probably piggybacks off of that degrees of order. Um, it seems to me that uh, when I think of stacking as a disciplinary issue, um, the, the sort of um, the orders, the classical <laughs> orders being stacked in the Colosseum or the Palazzo Rucellai uh, is an important uh, reference. And in all of what you're calling the contemporary stacks that you showed, there's very almost declaratively uh, an absence of hierarchy. In other words, the things at the bottom are not the same, or are the same. They're not necessarily uh, heavier or uh, support more weight than the things at the top. So in Michael Meredith's boxes or in the Herzog and Buron, it's the same thing at the bottom as at the top, and it's not about showing anything, any differentiation as it goes up. It's not about getting lighter or uh, fading off. So I'm wondering about like uh, if if we can frame this uh, not necessarily in terms of uh, that there's a progressivism that we have gone beyond hierarchy, but if we've eradicated hierarchy from this idea of stacking, where where do we go with this? Well, it's one thing for it to be lighter, and it's another thing for the appearance of lighter, right? You know, as 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 in the Colosseum. And like I said at the beginning of the talk, I, you know, I, I I had shied away from having a cultural or political argument, which I think would also be entailed in terms of the hierarchical way of viewing the Colosseum, right? That that uh, the Corinthian is the most advanced order versus the Doric, you know, which I think historically actually doesn't hold up anyway. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I'm, but I see the parallel though between, you know, thinking about that in terms of hierarchy and thinking about the and kind the of preference for it in architectural <clears throat> discourse after postmodernism, which is, you know, nothing's supposed to be hierarchical and, you know, I mean, everything's a rhizome, you know, and everything, you know, kind of taken uh, as equal. And so this is, this is actually, I think, where Marcello's work is, is, um, it, it is probably the most telling work is the idea that of the thing being top heavy, right? So that, you know, instead of there, this, you know, kind of sameness at every level, that um, the idea that the, if the morphological trajectory of all of these, you know, sort of parts to whole is one of a kind of top heaviness, that starts to introduce, um, a, a, you know, again, that kind of tipping point that almost, you know, that, 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 that almost failing, and I've only I only just touched on it um, here, but I think could definitely you know be expanded on you know fruitfully. Um, Thanks very much for coming. Thanks. Make it a class. Thank you.